Good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the opening program for this year's News Lit Camp for National News Lit Week, brought to you by the News Literacy Project and our partners at EW Scripps Company. My name is Demario Phipps Smith. I'm a journalist and the senior uh, manager of community learning at NLP, and I'll be your host during this session as we dive into the ethics of journalism and corporate parent responsibility. Before I introduce our esteemed guests today, I'd like to start with a few housekeeping notes. So first, all of these sessions will re be recorded and they'll be shared following uh, this news lit camp. You can request a certificate of attendance through the feedback survey offered at the end of the program. Um, all copies of the presentations, as well as the resources um, that are mentioned today, will be shared via email at some point next week. And as a reminder, all of the resources that you see today are completely free. And we, um, we uh, ask you to share these resources with your colleagues and friends. Thank you. As for use of messages for the webinar, you can use the chat feature for general messages to attendees or to send a note to myself or one of the hosts. And you can use the QA feature, the, uh, the question and ask feature to ask a question that we'll get to during the Q&A portion of the session at the end. So joining me today, and we're so lucky to have these two amazing journalists join us today. Um, thank you for joining us to Christina Hartman, who is the head of new standards overseeing editorial standards and editorial independence of scripts, networks, divisions, news branches, or news brands. Her responsibilities include actively ensuring a culture of inclusivity that supports civil, open exchange of ideas leading to strong editorial coverage of the diversity of the human experience. Previously, she's worked at, as the vice president of Script News and includes stints working in production on CNN's State of the Union and Reliable Sources. Thank you so much for uh, being here today, Christina. We really look forward to hearing from you today. And also joining us is Sean McLaughlin. He is the head of new standards overseeing edi editorial standards and editorial independence of Scripps Network's division news brands. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, he is responsible for developing and overseeing company-wide strategy for news operations for the company's more uh, than 60 stations in over 40 markets. Uh, Sean, it works with stations to customize uh, content strategy across broadcast, digital, and social platforms using qualitative and quantitative market research. He has helped lead initiatives related to diversity in newsrooms and uh, with a commitment to high impact community journalism before coming to strip, uh, Scripps. McLaughlin was the executive news director and uh, creative service director for KMOV TV in St. Louis for over six years. He has also served as the news director at KTUL and KOKI in Tulsa. Thank you both for joining us today. I'm really looking for the, uh, forward to this conversation. And uh, we'll start, um, I listed a lot of really cool things that you guys have worked on um, in your career, but could you uh, lay the foundation for the work that you do and what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? And we'll start with you, Christina. Sure. Well, um, first of all, thank you for the very generous um, introduction and, and thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Um, as you said, I oversee standards for our national news networks. That's Scripps News and Court TV. That just means I help uh, leaders at both of the networks make ethical decisions in tricky situations. So questions like, how do we know what we think we know? Are we being fair and ethical in our news gathering and reporting? Um, and how do we minimize harm in our work? Um, in the last year, and I think we'll, we'll be talking about some of these topics in particular, but um, some of our most difficult discussions internally in the last year have dealt with 
uh, the war in Gaza, developments in artificial intelligence and um, uh, generative deep fakes, um, fairness and objectivity in the 2024 election, uh, uh, and a host of of, of other uh, issues, which I look forward to talking about in, in more detail. Thank you. Sean, could you explain a little bit more about your day-to-day -day work and responsibilities? Yeah, good morning. Well, I'm glad to be here and appreciate everybody taking uh, time to talk about this important topic. I spend a lot of time on airplanes. Uh, we, you know, we have 41 local newsrooms around the country. I work really closely with our uh, local news leaders on, you know, this is a this is a challenging time in local news. There's a there's a lot changing. Uh, a lot of audience perception changes. Uh, where people get their news is changing. And, you know, I work really hard with our local news leaders to, you know, develop products that connect with audiences that are more representative of what's actually happening in a community that are inclusive of more voices within those communities. Uh, and really the evolution uh, of, of, of local news and, and, and tying into uh, you know, a lot of the work Christina does, you know, in terms of, you know, the quality of the work, you know, it's not just going out and doing newscasts. It's, you know, a real focus on the quality of the journalism that we do and the importance of it. And, uh, you know, moving past some of the challenges that we are experiencing and trying to execute that on a daily basis. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for explaining what you mm -hmm. all do. Let's get into the conversation. I think at uh, the News Literacy Project, we speak about finding credibility for news outlets through the standards of quality journalism. And the ones that are often talked about are things like fairness, accuracy, and objectivity. Um, but what do these standards really mean to you? And how do they uh, work at your newsroom? How do you implement these types of standards in your newsroom? That's a great question. Oh. Um, um, I, let me start with objectivity, which is, which is the, the last one you listed because objectivity has, um, in a lot of ways, um, at least within the field of journalism, be, become a dirty word, not because of what it means, right? Objectivity is, is, is effectively fairness and, and, and accuracy and even handedness, but in the, in the field of journalism, um, specifically it's a, it's a controversial word or has become a controversial word. Um, um, because of how it's been expressed. Um, in, in, the, in the past, um, objectivity was sort of seen as a like performative display of, of, of disinterest, meaning um, you're sort of a fly on the wall, you have no you know, feelings about what you're covering um, and, and that that's objectivity. Um, other, other kind of performative behaviors associated with uh, past expressions of objectivity are things like um, giving equal weight to you know both sides regardless of 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 the facts um, so there are good reasons why uh, that that practice um, is is controversial a because it doesn't work and it's not a reflection of of reality but what but what objectivity, um, again, really boils down to is accuracy and uh, and fairness, and that's how we look at it uh, at Scripps. So we we don't talk about you know equal time to two sides um, of an issue because that's a that's a sort of superficial metric. What we talk a lot about is the intended outcome um, of a mindset that is intended to give our audiences. Um, a comprehensive look at the facts so that they can decide for themselves um, uh, how how they feel about an issue um, or an event. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't have feelings about an issue. I think this is probably the most important evolution in the thinking about objectivity in journalism. Um, you can have feelings about an issue. We're all human it's what makes our work powerful and impactful is that we you know are humans we have feelings we have a point of view we come to what we do uh uh you know with with that sort of aggregation of, of life experiences um what what objectivity really is though is it's it's earnestly interrogating the facts wherever they lead you regardless of your of your um of your feelings and your experiences and then sometimes it means like a, a willingness to be wrong, like what you are inclined to believe through the practice of 
of investigating and reporting potentially being wrong. Uh, and that's Absolutely. what that's that's how we view objectivity. Awesome. We're going to get more. We're going to dive deeper into objectivity in a minute. But Sean, um, mm -hmm. what does uh, journalism standards like fairness, accuracy, and causing the least amount of harm? What do those things mean to you? And how do you try to implement that in the work that you do? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting, as Christina was talking, one of the things that I was thinking about is we've you know been so intentional in our efforts to not just have policies, but have open conversation and communications, have these be living, breathing things that happen inside editorial newsrooms every day. But was, you know, the whole recognition and training we did around implicit bias a while back and the recognition that we all come from perspective and have sort of these different insights and world experiences. Uh, but, you know, what I think for us, what it's really led to is an effort to open up process and open up conversation and elevate voice inside our newsrooms. <clears throat> you know, one of the things as we went through and we're analyzing sort of, you know, and this whole idea of getting people past this notion of two sides to a story, there's, you know, countless sides to a story. How do you more, you know, how do you effectively cover it broadly and with the kind of depth that gets at more of these perspectives? But, you know, what we found, and, you know, I can tell you in the 15 years I ran newsrooms, you know, there was just a very small group of people who were involved in these decisions. It was, you know, news directors, maybe a couple of key managers who really sort of were tasked with this. And what we started finding as we looked at it is, you know, a lot of those people look similar. A lot of those people have real similar type backgrounds, and there's a lot of other voices and perspectives that are never brought to light inside the process of not just deciding what the news is, but, you know, the approaches to covering the news. And when this, you know, really came to light is in some of the more controversial, you know, it comes up in political coverage, it came up, uh, uh, you, you know, in uh, some of the other major national news stories over the last couple of years where not enough people felt comfortable having voice inside that editorial process. So when I would be at stations, people would be like, yeah, I was thinking that. And I just was not comfortable sharing my opinion. So what we've really tasked our leadership, leader, news leaders with is, you know, diversification of the editorial structure of the newsroom, the news management system, but man, elevating voice, creating a mm -hmm. culture where everybody feels free to share a different point of view or a broader perspective to help us get to that uh, objectivity as you know, it's something we strive for every day. It's hard to do, but it's something that you really got to push and think about and talk about and have be a, a key part of your decision-making process. Awesome. Uh, Christina, you touched on a really important um, topic uh, in national discussions about journalism right now, and that's objectivity, both inside journalism circles and among the uh, general public. The question of objectivity and what it means and how journalism organizations carry that out today is in question, and it's a conversation people are having. So could you talk a bit about why objectivity is such a complicated and nuanced term as it relates to journalism? Yeah, I I mean, I think it's really, I, I you know, there are words that take on baggage because of um how, how it's come to be defined. Objectivity, I feel like, is one of them. People rightly and understandably within the field of journalism see objectivity as something that means, you know, giving equal time to polar opposite sides of an issue. Um, uh, so it has that 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 baggage, but I but I, but what it really means again is is fairness and accuracy and a willingness that what you want to be true might not be. I, I'll give um, a, a personal example that I, it's a, a story I tell our reporters um, frequently, which is, um, so I've got a, a, a son who's now 10 years old, but when he was about five or six, he was really close with um, uh, a, a friend in the neighborhood and they would, you know, he'd, he'd always be at our house or my son would always be at, at his house and toys would get exchanged between the homes uh and my son had told me i i think i i think he's taking some of my legos and i said oh well why don't you ask him about it and one day as as the friend was leaving he gets up and a bunch of legos spill out of his pockets <laughs> and i'm like oh you know so i i i talked to him and i i talked to his mom and i just said like hey if you want to borrow anything just just let us know so fast forward a couple of months from that, and there's a dispute over whose transformer uh, a, a particular toy was. My son says, 
you know, this, that, that's mine. He took it and, you know, he took it home. His friend says, no, this is, this is, this is mine. I want to believe my baby, right? Cause he's my baby. Um, I love him. He's, you know, he's, he's honest. He's not going to lie to me. And also I saw his friend take Legos a couple of, of months ago. So I believed him. I talked to um, the mom because this became like a, like a, a, a blow up, but his, um, his, the, the friend's mother. And she says, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. I think that's, that's his. And I, it could have been kind of like an impasse that created like some, some awkwardness, but I really wanted to, to know. And so I, um, I talked to my son a couple of times and I said, can you tell me like when, when you got it, where did it come from? And he started kind of fumbling. And then I was like, you know, I don't go to the store. Everything that he has, I have ordered off Amazon. Let me go through my, <laughs> my Amazon order history. I didn't see it there. And so then I was like, you know what? Maybe grandma bought it. So I took a picture. I sent it to grandma and she said, no, I don't see that in my order history. So then I go back with my investigation, my evidence <laughs> to my son. And I say, hey, I, are you sure that this was yours? Because look, here's my Amazon order history. Grandma says she didn't get it for you. Are you sure? that that was yours and he breaks down starts crying and he's like no it's not mine it was his I just wanted it and it was such a um it's such a sort of moment for me um and I I think has a lot of of relevance like that you know I mean it's a toy it's a transformer but it's but it's that that idea that what you want to believe is true or what you're inclined to believe is true and what maybe at what time at some other time and in some other circumstance was true such as in the case of the you know the legos uh, a, a couple of, of months ago may not be true this time and requires a really earnest exploration um, of the facts a seeking of evidence and again a willingness to be wrong right like if i were unwilling to be wrong I would not have gone through my Amazon order history. And I would have always looked at poor little Peyton, like you stole <laughs> my, my little boy's transformer. And that is, so So when you take something that, that micro and sort of pull it out to covering the biggest, most urgent pressing issues of our time, journalists have a serious, heavy responsibility to be willing to be wrong, um, despite their experiences, their affiliations, their affinities, their community sympathies. Um, and, and I have plenty, we all have plenty, right? Um, yeah. but, but, but it's the ability to nonetheless um, pursue potentially <laughs> being wrong. Excellent. Um, to follow up on that, Sean, I, I, we talk, we've been talking about objectivity here, but could you give us what a, what the definition is for people who might not be familiar with it? As journalists, we talk about it a lot, but do you mind defining it? And then also, what do you think, why do you think is so complicated and nuanced at this time? Why there's so many conversations about it? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, I think it's, it, it's the ability to step away and gather all the information and present it in a way that's that's fair. And I think, and, and I know that sounds over simple, but I think it, you know, at, at the highest level, it, it's it's yep. it's relatively simple. And, and 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 part of that involves not just recognize any sort of internal bias, but also recognizing uh, what a lot of reporters will do when you have conversations, they'll jump to conclusions. There's an assumption or a hypothesis on the front end of a story. And so, and listen, one of the challenges, make no mistake, one of the biggest challenges I think reporters deal with is time is not on their side. There's a lot going on. They got to move quickly. Yep. Hey, I got to get out the door. I'm pretty sure I'm going to hear A, B, and C. I got to quick turn that around and get it out there. That becomes very dangerous because then selective listening starts happening. And so, you know, it's just, so it really is a very conscious effort, particularly when you're treading into an area where there's a lot of controversy, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's just a, a lot of emotion that you're able to do that. And then, it, you know, and the second part, part of this, and this is where I think the responsibility on, on all of us lies, is 
what are the systems in place to check that? You know, because if we just if we just if we just let every reporter go do a story and, and published it, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have a lot of problems. We have to have strong editorial systems and you know fact verifying approaches and things like that. So I mean, that's how I look at it. Um, and what's the second part of your question? Um, and yeah, yeah, just why is it nuanced? No, there, there, there's you know, there are a lot of challenges now. I'll tell you the biggest one that I see on a day to day basis. You know, we 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 have a mix of kinds of stations. We have some large market stations where you tend to have reporters who have a higher level of experience. They've been around a while. They, and then we have some smaller markets where we have a lot of reporters who are coming out of school. One of the things I see a lot is in younger journalists, they don't understand how things they do in their personal life, social media obviously being a big one impacts the public view of their objectivity. And, mm. and, the, and, the, and the other part that, that I think complicates this, there's a lot of well-intentioned young journalists who want to be involved in the political process, or they want to show support yep. behind an issue or a candidate. And, you know, that, that's, that causes issues. And, and, and we've done, you know, and I know we'll talk more about this later, but, you know, when we talk to audiences or the public in general about trust of local news organizations man, or national news organizations, too, those things matter. Yeah. And, and they look and they see these things. I mean, so, you know, I think that it's just sort of that mindset of recognizing when you make a decision to be a journalist, you now more than ever, this isn't like, you know, 20 years ago, it's much more complicated now. You got to go really above board and think about the appearance of everything that you publish, everything you post, whether it's personal or private, because those things people do take and connect dots sometimes that shouldn't be connected. But if mm -hmm. you're not thinking about that, it really can create an impression that you're maybe not being impartial or that your uh, objectivity is being questioned. Great. Um, and I guess, uh, so this leads me to my next question. Um, has there been an instance where Scripps has had to issue like a major correction or retraction or had to make a difficult decision about maybe someone, you know, wanting to take a stance or an issue or participate in a demonstration or a rally of some sort? Um, is, is there an instance of that that you all can talk about? We'll start with uh, uh, we'll start with Sean on this. I mean, I'll, you know, those get to be some sensitive issues, so I'll talk kind of high level about it. But we, you know, we've had we've had instances in time where we've had to terminate reporters for violating exactly, and and sometimes it starts as an innocent looking thing. Uh, there's one incident I I recall several years ago in one of our markets where there was a, a you know a concert being put on that was politically oriented, and 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 you know it was a fundraiser for a candidate, and you know one of our reporters thought it was okay to go to something like that. And again, just not, you know, thinking about the appearances that something like that can create. And so, you know, we're a company that takes these things uh, real seriously. Uh, you know, and I think one of the things that we talk a lot about with our news managers, and it's like it echoes a point Christina brought up, is one of the things that we hear a lot from people is that news in general doesn't do a good job of owning mistakes. They know we make them, right? In the course of just through the covering breaking news, something change is a little bit different than what we thought or assumptions that were made early in a in a big story coverage. And they feel like we try to hide it or we try to bury it or it's hidden somewhere small on our website. And there's this really, and, and this, as we talk about sort of how people have lost some trust in news, that's one of the issues uh, that come into play. So we tell stations, listen, these mistakes happen. If you produce a lot of news, there's going to be small things that slip through the cracks, a name that's wrong, a wrong video that gets shown. And, you know, the whole idea of proportional response, you know, I mean, you know, if that was your lead story and it was high profile all day, running a little correction snippet after sports at the end of a newscast, you know, isn't going to cut it in the eyes of consumers. So I think these are things that happen. And I just think, uh, you know, in terms of big mistakes, you know, like, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, I've seen those too, and I just think, uh, I think overall, though, generally, we have pretty good systems. We have a legal review process. We have managers that know when we're doing the kinds of stories where major factual, impactful, impactful factual mistakes can happen. Um, and you know, and I think those systems are overall pretty strong. It's more these little day to day small things that I think can add up over time. Great, um, Christina. I can talk about a, talk about a correction. I mean. Uh, I'm like looking for some wood to knock on, but um, <laughs> oh, there's a paper box that'll hopefully that go. But <laughs> but thankfully, no major major corrections. And I do I define major as um, our mistake could have misled 
um, uh, uh, audiences. But um, but I I will think of one um, correction in particular that was um, nonetheless a big uh, mistake, and it sort of um, a, it dovetails with ob objectivity in our conversation there. So um, uh, there was a um, a lawsuit brought by um, the the former student of the uh, Broken Arrow School District, uh, probably a, a, a relevant one for our educators in the audience here. Um, uh, the student um, uh, was was Native American and um, uh, uh, had uh, requested permission um, from the school district to um, wear a um, uh, an eagle feather on her um, on her graduation uh, attire. The school had sort of uh, rules around um, uh, uh, decorative uh, devices on 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 graduation attire and and had a process by which um, people seeking um, uh, exceptions for. Uh, uh, for religious reasons and the like, uh, that they could request um, an exception to that rule. Um, uh, uh, this the student alleges she was uh, denied and and punished for for doing it anyway. So uh, uh, one of our reporters, um, who was very um, passionate about the uh, issue, took up the story, um, spoke with the. Uh, it spoke with the student, the student's mother, and the student's attorney. Um, and uh, when it when it got to review, um, the editor very rightly says, asks the reporter, "What does the school district say? What is the school district's version uh, of 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 these events?" incredibly important in a situation particularly that has become a, 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 a legal conflict mm -hmm. um, that that reporter told their editor I reached out and they didn't respond now this is one of many many we we put a ton of of, of of faith and trust in our reporters who are equipped with all the training and tools um, an experience of of the of the trade, um, and so when when an editor asks a reporter, "Did you reach out?" and the reporter says, "I did. I didn't hear back." Um, typically, that's enough, right? Then you put in a note that we've you know we've made multiple attempts to reach out. We did not hear back. Here's the thing: immediately after publication, we heard from the school district which forwarded us their immediate response to our reporter's inquiry. Um, it was an incredibly embarrassing mistake in its basicness, right? Um, because what happened in that community, and this is very unfortunate for the story in as as a whole, because that omission became the story. It was, it was, it, it took over what the story was actually supposed to be about, which is why we use actually this as an example in our spot training with reporters is like, if you miss a small thing, in this case, this was not a small thing, but if you miss even a small thing, that small thing can subsume your story and throw away all your other work because that becomes where everybody is looking. Um, we have since now, <laughs> Now, when when editors ask reporters if we've reached out and they say they haven't heard back, now editors have to ask, show me. Um, and so we've kind of, you know, shored shored that up. But but we we had to issue a a correction in that case. It was very uh, uh, unfortunate. I won't speak to what the you know reporters' motivations um, may or may not have have been to choose not to include that that statement, but it, it was a problem. Wow. And it and it just it shows how important it is to get it all right. Absolutely. We're coming up a little bit on time here, so I'm going to get into our last question, our last discussion question before we get into some Q and A. But please feel free to answer um, as. Uh, honest as you want about this question, but 
clearly throughout this conversation, we've had, you talked a lot about the ethics and the guidelines that you have in place to protect um, not only the journalists, but the institution from causing harm to communities and other people. Um, so why do you personally think that it's important to have guidelines in journalism? And then what role does the parent companies that might own a journalistic uh, entity, what role does the parent company have in implementing some of these guidelines? And uh, does it affect in, uh, editorial independence? I mean, I'll we'll start with yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll jump in on that in terms of, I mean, you know, to me, there's pretty clear broad framework speaks to your value, you know, as a company, you know, Scripps prides ourselves in being a journalism company. We have a lot of journalists who work for us and the sort of these high level strategies or high le level, uh, you know, codes of conduct or ethic guidelines are, you know, meant to serve as a framework for the journalism we do across the company. You know, the, the the daily news decision, you know, what's the lead story in Tulsa or what's today's news in Baltimore, you know, those are local decisions. And so what where I think success comes is when you take the, you know, the framework uh, built around responsible and quality journalism and then marry that with the local expertise uh, and deep understanding of the local communities we have to keep reputable news products. Um, you know, that that's how I look at it. And I think, and listen, here's, here's, I'm, you know, to call out the elephant in the room, not every company that owns, you know, TV stations views it that way. There are some who do have a bias or perspective or political motivation in their approach to news. That's something that should scare all of us because we all get painted with that brush. And we've seen where that has become pretty high profile. I'm amazed. One thing that's changed in this business in the last 10 years, nobody ever used to know who owned a local TV station. It used to not matter. And in fact, it wasn't uncommon that reporters who worked at TV stations didn't even know who owned them. Um, now it's a part of the conversation. And, you know, and, and the burden on all of us who are committed to this is that, you know, part, part of it is policy. And part of it is persuasion and 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 just doing, I feel like I'm campaigning a lot. I'm inside newsrooms advocating for the importance of objectivity and quality and, and being very above board and doing all these things because what we do is important and matters. And I don't think the audience sees it now for what it is because of some of the, some of the noise that's going on. Yeah, uh, I just reminded me, Sean. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Demario. No, you're, you're talking about it. I was just going to, I was just going to um, just ask you the same thing. But yeah, if you could elaborate on why uh, or what the relationship is between the corporate, uh, the corporate parent, and how you all might go about setting guidelines and, and standards for the organization. Yeah, I well, one of the things that um, Sean was talking about just reminded me in looking at our our digital um, analytics. One of the things that um, has surprised me in the in the last, I would say, year or two, um, especially, is the increasing popularity of the About Us page yep. Yep. and the Meet the Team page. People are looking; they see a you know piece by a reporter, they want to go read that reporter's bio. They want to go one of one, a if you do like a you know a, a Google um, a fill in thing, um, people people ask. Who owns, you know, X brand, X company? This is a matter of high interest to people, and I see that as a as a as a good thing. Um, it's it's an opportunity for us to respond to that curiosity with transparency. So we're in, currently in the process of really beefing up our reporter bios um, and asking our reporters to share more about how they approach. It used to be a very kind of templatized. You know, this person has worked at this place, studied this thing, and it's from, you know, X place. We're working on significantly beefing those up to to really include um, uh, uh, context around how the reporter views their beat or the geography that they that they cover. Because what consumers are telling us is that they want to know. Specific to your question around um, uh, around. Um, um, corporate parenthood um the 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 role of a of a corporate parent in our in our newsrooms is to set a culture and a set of values at scripts those values are honesty accuracy fairness minimizing harm independence and obeying the law um 
And all of those things um, really actually mean something. There are training modules associated with each of those things. Let, I'll give an example of, of obey the law. This is actually a um, an intentional choice by Scripps to tell its journalists one of our, uh, let's see, was that six, seven? Honesty, accuracy, fairness, minimizing harm, independence, obey the law. One of our six sort of values intentionally is obey the law. And what that means on a practical level is there are some news organizations where say you're at a um, at a at a at a protest and police tell the entire crowd to disperse, including journalists. Now there are real um, legal uh, questions depending on the on the circumstances as to whether police can dismiss journalists from public from public witness. But in any case, um, there are some organizations that are okay with their reporters actually fighting that on the scene. Um, um, Scripps, as part of sort of setting its values, is telling its reporters, obey the law at that time. We got your back after and we'll fight it after the fact because we care about your safety first. All of those things that I listed really come with a set of sort of behaviors and processes associated with bringing those qualities to life in our in our work. So that that's how the role of Scripps as a corporate parent across its its brands um, sort of influence our, our our newsrooms is that those things should really come through in not only the work product but the the the, the process of, of 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 news gathering. Awesome. Thank you so much for really peeling back what that relationship looks like and really giving solid examples of how that plays out. Um, we've had a great conversation thus far, but now I'd love to get into a few audience, maybe two audience questions, two or three audience questions before we uh, log off from this session. The first uh, is around AI, and I see a lot of uh, people asking questions about AI right now. But what uh, are you all's uh, set of policies or values around the use of AI in the newsroom? Are there any specific policies that you have enacted? I am. Let me just start by saying I am. I, I don't think it can be um, like understated how transformative an impact AI will have on the media and information ecosystem. Um, our guidelines are relatively simple to our newsrooms. Um, and those guidelines are that a human being is always responsible for the facts that they gather. Now, are there permissible uses for um, AI kind of in the margins? Um, for example, our, our reporters use AI transcription, right? Like they you know, they they do an interview, they can upload the file and a tool like Otter or uh, I'm blinking on um, some of some of the others out there, but uh, uh, will generate a transcript along with time codes. These are significant tools that can save our reporters a lot of time. Back in the day, I remember one of my first jobs was transcribing, you know, live live interviews as fast as my fingers could type. Um, it saves them a lot of, of time. But there again, if you are going to use a, a quote and Otter you know, kicks out a transcription, you as the human are responsible for going back and listening and making sure that that transcription is accurate. So the overall guiding principle is human always responsible. I think there's a lot of interesting experimentation, you know, that that we've we had conversations about regarding, you know, versioning of stories and how can a reporter build, you know, a primary, you know, version of their story. And then uh, an AI tool helps generate versions that air on other platforms. Again, to Christina's point, eyeballs still have to see it before it, you know, becomes consumer facing. But I think helping with the workflow and again, the, the part Christina talked about, about transcribing, that's, that's real time. And so I think the hope is using AI as a smart additive tool that frees up more time to allow the reporters to do the journalism and the fact checking and things that ultimately are going to uh, be most important. Yes. Can I zoom out on something with with just AI more broadly because it's 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 really an appeal to the educators um, in 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 the audience. Um, we saw ahead of um, the New Hampshire primary on on Tuesday, just a couple of, of days ago, um, uh, the 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 existence of robocalls purporting to be um, uh, President Biden telling people not to vote. The the threat of 
um, AI driven deep fakes that are getting more and more and more um, realistic and difficult to discern against the backdrop of um, the fact that tools designed for the detection of AI deep fakes are at this time wholly ill suited for the task um, of definitively identifying AI, AI deep fakes. The, the, the net impact um, of that, that we as a society should be um, really thinking about and thinking about solutions toward is, is the fact that it has the potential to flood an already oversaturated disinformation environment with more bad information. What do you do when you're deluged with, it, it destabilizes the idea of truth. You, you yeah. have people then end up with, you know, no real idea of what truth is. So my appeal to the educators in the in the in the in the audience is media literacy, news literacy. Really, the point of this um, of 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 this session and this series of, um, of 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 workshops is to teach people what good sources are, what responsible sources are, how to detect real from fake in the best way that we can, how can we, um, how to be skeptical and how to do research. So, so, so important. Uh, absolutely. Great points. Like, both. Um, just... Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was going to say, the, the, one of the things that I think this really does, it's so profound. You know, one of the most powerful weapons we always had as journalists is, you know, the whole ability, the whole ability for somebody consuming our content. Hey, I, want, I need to see it with my own eyes. Hey, we found the documents. We have the video. We, here's the definitive proof. Now everything's questioned. And even if it's legitimate, people claiming it's fake, really big deal, really kind of scary going forward. It is. AI is one of the biggest topics that uh, we teach now. It's been one of the most popular and requested things that we, that's been asked for as far as training. So thank you so well, much. We might be sure. making some requests of you too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for answering that. But before we let you go today, um, there's a question I wanted you to answer quick, maybe give a point or two really quick. We only got a couple of minutes, but um, an attendee asks, I oversee a high school newspaper and oftentimes access to sources can be limited. So what is your best advice for assuring that we report on stories fairly when we may not have access to all the sources before publishing? Well, that's a tough, I, it's almost so vague, it's hard to answer. I think I mean, making sure you have broad understanding of, of of what the topic is. I mean, yeah, it's it's hard to report a story if you don't have all the information or you don't have access to it. I mean, yeah, I don't know, Christine, if you have any thoughts, just first. um, yeah, I so I'm gonna make a couple of assumptions, and I apologize because I'm I'm not I'm not um sure of the circumstances, but let's say let's say you're struggling to get principal sources. So a story is about someone or some department. Um, and 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 you can't get anyone to talk to you who's sort of a principal. Then you start to you, you broaden your 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 scope in your search of voices that are relevant, of course, with very very clear um, uh, uh, disclosure to audiences around how close that person that you were able to get um, is to the story. Um, academics, experts are great for color and context. Um, again, provided, you know, say you're covering, uh, you know, some some new policy and you can't get the agency or team that that issued that policy to talk, but then you could talk to an academic who studies that policy realm with, mm -hmm. you know, context to the audience that, you know, this, this particular expert was not involved in this policy, but says, you know, policies more broadly around this. Um, you just have to sort of start to expand, um, um, you know, the the circle of sources that you're trying to um, reach. There are, of course, also, um, you know, ways of getting, you know, more aggressive and trying to pursue sources that, 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 um, that, that might not talk and more aggressive ethically and responsibly without invading people's privacy. Um, uh, but I apologize. That's probably the best I could do with that with the detail we have. No, I think your point your points around sourcing are excellent. I think thinking innovatively and like expansive about who could be a source in a way that will add to the story, right, and really give people context about what you're talking about is a great point. Um, and with that, um, I want to honor everyone's time. I think this is a good place to end the conversation. 
Thank you so much for joining us. We have some great programming for you for today, scheduled all throughout the day. Um, you can scan, I'm going to share my screen so that you all can get access to our QR code um, for you to complete a small survey in which you will be able to um, get your uh, certificate of attendance. Um, please scan the QR code to complete the survey. Um, a recording of the program will be sent out in the following email next week. Again, thank you for joining us for this year's News Lit Camp. I hope that this opening session really gets you excited for the programming today. I hope to see you all in our next session on the importance of connecting authentically with audiences at 10.05 Eastern Standard Time. Thank you so much, Christina and Sean. You were wonderful. I really appreciate you both taking the time today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day.